Can I tell you, I know I'm supposed to preach this today. Like, I know I'm supposed to preach this. I, I, was, I was playing around with two different passages of scriptures in my mind, and I came down from a little office and came downstairs. True story. My wife will uh, corroborate this. Came downstairs, and uh, we were making the kids watch Bible stories. And right when I come downstairs, she is flipping through the little Bible stories on YouTube, and uh, she shouts out a title of one of the Bible stories that was the exact passage of Scripture I was studying. I said, oh, that's what I was studying. So I watched it with my kids, uh, the animated version of this text we're about to go to today, and I'm telling you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bless you. It's going to bless you. So go with me to Acts 27. Acts 27. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 27. And we'll start at verse number 20. Go down to verse number 26. Will, how you feeling? Glad you made it. Good to see you. Where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> no, he flew in today. He just made it in. So we were praying. We were praying. If I would have been up there playing the piano, it would have been a rough service. So I'm glad that he made it. Acts 27. We'll start at verse number 20. When you're ready to read it, say, yeah. yeah. If you need some time to find it, say, hold up. Beautiful. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. No one had eaten for a long time. And finally, Paul called the crew together and said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. Hmm. Crete. Anybody brought a paper Bible? Paper, okay. Just need to see where the real save folks. If you got a paper Bible, free country, but maybe just like circle or underline Crete. Just underline Crete. And we'll talk, highlight it. We'll talk about it later. Look at what Paul said. He said, you would have avoided all this damage and loss, but... Take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety Ooh, to everyone sailing with you. In other words, there are people on this boat that are going to get blessed, not because of them, but because of you. Look at somebody next to you and say, it's a blessing for you to be connected to me. It's a blessing for you to be connected to me. You, you don't even know. You don't even know. Hey. Verse 25. So take courage. For I believe God, and it will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. Can you say amen? amen. Oh, I feel like preaching. Heather, I'm glad you're in the house today. You have, if you need trouble or you know, don't know how you respond to preaching, just watch Heather. Okay. I want to I wanna preach today. I want to preach today using this as a title. I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. I want you to look at your neighbor, probably for the last time, maybe not. But just look at your neighbor and just say, neighbor? Oh, neighbor. I told you so. Ooh, find another neighbor because that might have been rough, especially if that was your spouse and something happened before you got here. Come on, find another neighbor. Say, other neighbor. I got a word for you. I told you so. If you believe God can speak at the Toyota Music Factory, give him some praise up in here. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I told you so. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if there was ever a phrase that needed to be eradicated and erased from the English language, it's the phrase that I've entitled this message today, I told you so. It needs to be eradicated because think about this, never in the history of human interaction have those four words ever helped a situation. Never in your life have you gone through something and something happened and somebody said, I told you so, and then you actually felt better about the situation. As a matter of fact, to me, I told you so is right up there with the phrase we used to say on the playground, nanny nanny boo boo. <laughs> Who started nanny nanny boo boo? It's just, it's unnecessary. It is, it's extra. It is superfluous. And matter of fact, the, the only, the only time I told you so feels good ooh, is when you're the one who's saying it. That's the only time it feels good because how many know there is no reward like knowing, ooh, you were right the whole time. I wish y'all could stand up here and see all the ladies who are just smiling and nodding their head right now. Because by the way, if I told you so, had a mascot or a monument, monument, it would not be a male. No, no, no. It would be a female. It would be a woman standing like the Statue of Liberty talking about, I told you I told you so. I told you so only feels good if you're the one that's sharing it. And that's what I told you so really means. Here's what I told you so means. It means I was right, you were wrong. You should have listened to me, but you ignored my advice and you did not see the brilliance of my intelligence and you did not understand that I have the cognitive aptitude to always make wise decisions. That's what I told you so means. I told you so is like coming to Thanksgiving dinner whoo, with a slice of ego pie, a side of superiority, and a cup of smug. That is I told you so. So, and it is annoying to hear, especially when you're on the other side of it. It feels good when you get to declare it, but when you're on the other side of I told you so, when you were the one in the car that said, don't, don't tell me how to drive. I know where the place is. I know exactly where it is. No, no, we're not supposed to make a left. We're supposed to make a right. I am sure. Listen, let me drive. Do you want to drive? Drive. And you make the right and you keep driving and driving and driving. And, dr and drive so long that you hit your head. You know, this was not supposed to take this long to get here. And then finally, you pull out ways. Finally, humbly pull out ways. And ways tells you, make a U-turn, please. You should have listened and not made that right and made a left six hours ago. That is the frustration of I told you so. And here's what trips me out about I told you so. Sometimes the person doesn't even have to say it. I told you so can be a look. I told you so can be a feeling in a room. It can be an atmosphere. It can be an environment, an environment that you have to walk into because you know how you were. You were adamant about Fred. You're like, ooh, I'm telling y'all, Fred is the one. He's the one. I have found my boo. Fred is the one. And everybody that loves you is like, nah, boo, Fred is not it. Fred, don't do it. Don't do it. It's not, like Y'all don't see his value. Y'all don't see his potential. And you were so adamant about Fred. Fred, oh, you brought Fred to the Christmas party last year. You brought Fred to Thanksgiving dinner last year. And everybody told you Fred is not it. And whoo, Thanksgiving this week. <laughs> and Fred gone. And now you got to walk into the Thanksgiving room and have them ask you, where Fred? <laughs> and they don't have to say anything else. Because in the room is the feeling of I told you so. I told you so is a horrible feeling to be on the other side of it. Because I told you so makes it blatantly obvious to everybody around you that you made the wrong decision. The wrong decision. In fact, that's where I want to anchor a lot of my thoughts today because this text that we read in Acts chapter 27, at the center and the core of this text, is really just the wrong decision. And I told you so, it's only uttered on the backside of bad decisions. It's only 
after you made the wrong decision do people start saying, I told you. So wrong decisions. Ooh, I know some of y'all in here today, you're super saved. You floated into the Toyota Music Factory. You're a proud Sunday school alumnus. You got all kinds of scriptures in your head. And you know that there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. So you read a Proverbs a day to keep the dumb away. And so you're just, you're just incredible. And I know you always make good decisions. And if that's you, you can leave right now. I don't have a sermon for you today. But if there's any of us who are honest and humble enough to admit, ooh, I have made some wrong decisions. I have found myself scratching my head sometimes going, why did I go to that location? Why did I send that text? Why did I hire them? Why did I take this job? Why did I get that timeshare? Why did I say that? Why did I send that letter? Why? Have you ever been inundated with a wrong decision? Yeah. Wrong decisions are painful. Wrong decisions can have your heart flooded with regret and shame. And wrong decisions, hear me, who are inevitable. Wow. Wrong decisions are inevitable. They're inevitable because of how many decisions that you have to make. It's inevitable. So those of you that are tripping about the wrong decision, let me let just let you know, they are inevitable because of how many decisions that you have to make. From the moment you wake up in the morning, how many know you are constantly making decisions? Decisions. Donuts or granola? Coffee? No coffee. Red shirt, black shirt, leather pants, red pants. Every single day you wake up, you are constantly making decisions. In fact, this blew my mind. It is estimated that the average adult makes more than 35 thousand decisions per day. 35,000 decisions per day. From the moment you wake up, your mind is inundated with all kinds of decisions. I'm not just talking about big ones. I'm talking about little ones. But how many know sometimes you don't know which one is the big one and you don't know which one is the little one. You are constantly making decisions. And if you don't learn how to make the right decision and not the wrong decision, you will never get to the destination that God has for you. As a matter of fact, some of y'all are waiting until 2023 to start making your New Year's resolution. Why don't you just start early and say, this this is going to be my season to start making the right decisions and not the wrong decisions because decisions are powerful. Matter of fact, we spend an average of three hours a day, hear me, deciding what to eat, what time to go to bed, what to wear, and what to watch. Three hours a day deciding what to eat, what to wear, what to watch. Three hours a day just on those decisions. That's why Netflix is not $19.99 a month. No, Netflix does not cost you $19.99 a month. Netflix costs you your time. Ooh. That's why that Whopper, that Whopper does not cost $6.99. Oh, and that box of crumbly cookies does not cost $22.34. Don't ask me how I know. It don't cost you that. It don't cost you that. It costs you your health one box at a time. That's why your social media accounts are not free. They cost you your focus every time you scroll instead of focusing on the thing that God created and ordained you to do. It is eating away your time. One decision is taking time away from you. Decisions are critical. Decisions determine, hear me, the quality and the direction of your life. Decisions, decisions determine the stories that you will tell. Decisions are the steering wheel to your destiny. One research just said that internal and external factors such as feeling tired or stress and the weather also play a huge role in our decisions. Another researcher found out that when it comes to exercise, a staggering 66% of us agree that we struggle each day deciding whether we're going to work out or not. In another study, it found out that 40% of adults admitted to being guilty of making impulsive decisions. Yeah. That's that moment where you say, ah, screw it, I'm just gonna do it. Yeah. Just, let me just pause right there. Nothing has ever come good on the backside. <laughs> ah, screw it, I'm just gonna do it. If you're about to do that, please pause right there. But 40% of us make impulsive decisions. And here's the challenge of a wrong decision. It's when I make the wrong decision or a bad decision, I feel bad about the decision. And when I feel bad about the decision, I feel bad about me. And when I feel bad about me, I start feeling regret and shame. 
which leads me to make more bad decisions. And all of a sudden, the cycle begins of bad decision, bad feeling, which leads to another bad decision. And in our text today, we're understanding the detrimental proportions of what happens when you make the wrong decision. And sometimes you don't know it's the wrong decision until you're right in the middle of it. That's what's happening in Acts chapter number 27. Paul is in the middle of a bad decision. Acts 27 is all about a bad decision. Paul is dropped right in the middle of a bad decision. Actually, he's in the middle of a storm. A, storm, a crazy storm. As a matter of fact, uh, people in literature look at Acts 27 and Luke's Greek is so powerful. It is so uh, dramatic the way he talks about this. It's like a scene from Titanic. You should read the whole chapter when you get to the crib because this is a massive storm. This is a huge storm. The wind is heavy and the rain is pouring down. All of them are scared that they're about to lose their life. This is not a regular storm. This is a storm that you look at and say, I don't think I'm going to make it out of this right here. All hope was gone. And somebody in here or maybe watching online, you know what it's like to be in the middle of a storm where you're like, I don't know if I'm going to make it out of this storm right here. A storm that makes you say, I don't even know if I can get out of the bed today. This was a huge storm. Paul is dropped in the middle of a storm. And the reason he's in the storm is because of a bad decision. It was a bad, the storm is there because of a bad decision. See, we don't like that. It's especially in church, because church people always want to blame the devil. We need him. We need him, don't we? We're like, woo, this devil, this devil. I'm telling you, this devil. I'll be honest with you. This morning, I got ready to leave, and my car wouldn't start. My car wouldn't start at all today. And I was like, the devil is in my car. And I started thinking, wait a minute, I ain't changed the battery. <laughs> since I got this car. So I had to get jumped to get here today. But we need the devil. We got to blame the devil sometimes. But I wish the church would stop spiritualizing some practical things. Because how many you know it's not the devil sometimes. Sometimes it's just you made a decision. You responded to that DM. You went to that party. You charged it. You knew you didn't have the money walking out the store happy. You knew you didn't have the money. You made a decision. It wasn't the devil. Paul is in this storm because he made a decision. Actually, take that back. He didn't make the decision. Somebody else made the decision. Ooh, this is what jacked me up about the text. Is that Paul is in a storm, not from a decision that he made. He's in a storm because of a decision that somebody else made. Ooh, it's frustrating enough when you made the decision and you got to deal with the consequences. But what do you do when you're facing a storm because somebody else made the decision? You didn't make the decision, they did it, and now they got you on the boat. Talking about, I'm about to lose my life. See, this is what annoys me about some people because we love to think in our individualistic culture that what I do is me. It's all me. No, it's me. That ain't you. Mind your business. This is my life. It's my decision. It's my choice. Shut up. Every decision you make, every decision you make, I said that with love, every decision you make, it has ramifications on somebody else. Even your private decisions, it may take some years, but your private secret decisions will have public ramifications on other people. Stop thinking you're an island to yourself. Your decisions will affect other people. It'll affect generations to come. So away with this notion and ideology is I can do me. Worry about that. Let me do it. You do you and I'll do me. That annoys me. What happens when you doing you affects me? <laughs> Paul is in a storm, not because of a decision he made, but because of a decision that somebody else made. And it trips me out because in the middle of the wrong decision, Paul ooh, pulls a I told you so. They're in a storm. Think about this. It's raining. Stuff is flying. It's going crazy. And in the middle of the storm, Paul said, y'all come in real quick. They're like, huh? Y'all come in real quick. <laughs> I just want to say, I told you so. <laughs> so I'll let y'all know right now, <laughs> the reason all this equipment is flying across the boat right now is because you didn't listen to me. Yeah. I told you so. Ooh, Paul, that's messed up. In fact, I want to read it for you. Don't take my word for it. Can we look at it in verse number 21? Look at, look at what Paul does in the middle of the storm. It says, finally, Paul called the crew together and said, men, 
should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete, you would have avoided all this damage and all this loss. When I read that, I said, Paul, you petty. Paul, you petty. You are petty because in the middle of the storm, I told you so does not help anybody. How dare you have the nerve and audacity to gather the crew together in the middle of the storm and say, I told you so. I said, Paul, you being petty, that doesn't help anybody. That doesn't help anybody. Why in the world would you do that? But Paul reminded me he's got a right to be petty because he told them in Crete, you still got to underline, he told them in Crete not to leave. He told them don't do it. Understand that this boat that Paul is on is headed towards Rome. It's headed towards Rome. And right from the onset of the journey, it was crazy. The Bible says things like the winds were against them. It says that they lost a lot of time. the traveling through the Mediterranean. And it was an arduous journey from the start. They're stopping from port to port. And it is so obvious that there is a hindrance in this journey. Something is going on. So when they got to Crete, Paul did something that Homeland Security reminds all of us to do when you're at the airport. If you see something, say something. So Paul said, hold up, can I make a public service announcement? I don't think we should keep going. He said, this, this is bad. This is bad. And I said, Paul, you, you, you being petty, you, you don't have the right to do it, but, but it's true. Look at it in verse number 10. Verse number 10. I want you to see it. Acts 27, verse number 10. He said, men, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. Paul said that in verse number 10 in Crete before he ever reminded of them in the middle of the storm in verse number 21. The storm didn't start till verse number 14. Ooh, so you mean to tell me that the storm that started in verse number 14 would have been avoided if they would have just listened to Paul in verse number 10? You mean to tell me that the loss and the damage that occurred on that boat could have been stopped if they would have just listened to Paul in verse number 10? You mean to tell me that they could have wasted their lung power screaming, somebody, ah! can't swim if they would have just listened to Paul in verse number 10. You mean to tell me that there are some storms in your life that you actually don't have to go through if you will listen to wise counsel? You mean to tell me that often God will give you a warning before you step into some storms that he will give you some blues clues that this is not a good idea? It could have been stopped. You mean to tell me that before the rain came, when blue, Paul said, I'm telling you, we gonna die. Don't do it. Don't do it. Some storms can be stopped just by listening to wise counsel. Can I ask you, who do you listen to? Who has your ear? I'm still some from Dr. Phil. He said, Dr. Phil said, we got cancel culture. We need to flip it to council culture. Some of y'all need to listen to somebody and get some sound counsel. Are you the only one you talk to before you make a decision? That's scary if you're the only person that you talk to. You think that's a good idea? I sure do think it's a good idea. Let's go out here and do it. You about to lose your life. Paul said, don't go. And he told him in Crete. That means some storms in your life you actually don't have to go through. Some storms in your life can be canceled, hear me, if you would heed the wise counsel around you. So I asked myself, Paul, how come they didn't listen to you? How come they didn't listen to Paul when he told them, I see that this journey is going to be bad. Why? Understand, this is not Paul's first missionary journey. This is his third missionary journey. Paul has been there before. Paul has seen some shipwrecks. He's seen some battles. He's seen some storms. And I'm wondering, why wouldn't they listen to Paul? Why wouldn't they heed perhaps the greatest apostle that has ever lived? Wrote two-thirds of your New Testament. That, that seems like that's somebody to listen to when you're in the middle of a storm. But they didn't listen to Paul. And I think it was hard for them to hear Paul because of his chains. It was hard to hear him because of the chains that were wrapped 
around his arms. Understand that Paul is not on this boat as a passenger. He is on this boat as a prisoner for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when Paul, with chains on his ankles and on his hands, says, hey, I don't think we should go out there because a shipwreck is coming. They didn't listen because they didn't see him as an apostle. They saw him as a criminal. He's on this boat because he appealed to Caesar. He was a Roman citizen and said, I want a fair trial. So I appeal to Caesar as a Roman citizen. And he is going to Rome, waiting to stand before Caesar and to be tried and will ultimately be killed. But they didn't view him as an apostle. They viewed him as a criminal. It's interesting because when people don't see your value, they'll dismiss your voice. When people don't know the weight of what you carry and who you really are, it's easy for them to dismiss what you say. Can you see those sailors, those expert sailors on that boat talking about, look at him, can't even walk in them chains, trying to tell us, expert sailors, please get out of here. What do you know? You about to, you, you on your way to jail and you trying to give us life advice. They did not see the value of who Paul was. And when people don't see your value, they will dismiss your voice. Some of you are there right now where you are speaking up and there are people around you who do not see your value you and they dismiss your voice but God told me to tell you keep speaking anyway you cannot wait for other people on the vote to validate who you are if you are waiting for the validation of other people to start speaking up and saying what God told you to say you will never speak up and say what God told you to say I'm telling you don't let the opinions of other people on the boat stop you from declaring what God told you to say uh, as a matter of fact the storm will prove that your voice was right the storm, they didn't listen to Paul at first. They dismissed his voice at first. But how many know when that wind started blowing and it started getting bad, they said, oh, hold on, wait, wait a minute, what was that? You said the storm authenticated the validity of Paul's voice. It wasn't until they got to the storm that they realized, wait a minute, bring Paul back. I think he was saying something smart. See, people never know who's on the boat. They never see the value of people that are on the boat. Isn't that what they did with Jesus? They didn't know who was on their boat. The disciples accused Jesus, the most compassionate person of not caring about them. They said, don't you care? We about to die. But Jesus stands up in the middle of the storm and says, peace, be still. And all of a sudden they realize this is not an ordinary man. Who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? Oh, I want to talk to somebody who feels like people are walking past you and they don't see the value of your voice. Just wait for the wind. Wait for the storm. When the storm shows up they will see the value of what you carry so they they ignored Paul and said what you, what you know but when that storm came when the wind blew all of a sudden they realized that Paul must have been right when the storm came they realized they shouldn't have left from Crete you still got to underline Crete that's when everything broke out and Crete. I want to ask a question. Have you ever set sail from Crete? Hmm. Can y'all bring my boat? I know what you're thinking. That's the only boat you got in this big old venue? If y'all knew what it cost us to do church in this venue, you would shout for that boat right there. That's got the ball on the budget. <laughs> set sail from Crete. Crete is this place and the place where Paul said, I, I, I don't think we should leave. I think we should. It's, it's interesting because they did not listen to Paul. They rather listened to the owner of the boat and the captain of the boat, and then they took a vote. And majority said, man, what do he know? Let's go. Let's set sail from Crete. I told them all I needed is a boat and a bed sheet. Because <laughs> there's a picture of some of y'all right now. Set and sail 
into Crete. You ever been to Crete? Crete is the place where you ignore the warnings, you ignore the signs, you ignore that feeling on the inside of you, saying, mm. but you say, wait a minute, I've been doing this for years. I, I know. Have you ever set sail Ooh. from Crete? And it started off good. It started off good. They said, oh, we got good headway. And the Bible says, in an instant, the weather shifted. In a moment, it changed. That's how life works. You realize a text message can shift. One phone call can shift your life. In a moment, they set sail. From where? Crete. Crete. Ooh, this is going to mess you up. Crete. Crete. I told him I just needed a bed sheet. I need a bed sheet and a boat to get to Crete, to leave Crete. Crete ooh, translates to mean flesh and carnal. Crete is the place where you say, I think I know what's best because this feels good. Creed translates to mean flesh and carnal. I'm going to ask you again. Have you ever set sail out of your flesh? A boat in a bed sheet. You made a decision because it felt good to your flesh. Because it felt good to the carnal nature that you had, not the spiritual nature. They left from the place of carnality in the place of flesh. This is why desire is the enemy of discernment. Because it's hard to have discernment about something you want so bad. A boat in a bed sheet. It's hard to know it's the will of God when it feels so good to your flesh. See, you have to be careful when desire is born because desire is the enemy of discernment. Once my heart wants it, it sends a signal to my brain and it tells my brain, I really want this. Did you see her? Did you see him? I really want it. And once desire is conceived in your heart, it then goes to your brain. But your brain is smart enough to know that you won't Go through anything for just a want. But you will do anything for a need. So your brain upgrades the messaging from your heart. and says you need it. It could be Fred. I'm sorry if your name is Fred. <laughs> it could be a pair of shoes. But once my heart wants it, my brain will make a decision that I have to have it. And they sailed out from the place of carnality, from the place of their flesh. And so no wonder a storm ensued. I find it intriguing that this was not a regular ship. This was a grain ship. It was a grain ship that was set out to bring grain into Rome. Ooh, this was a business trip. So no wonder the owners of the boat and the pilot of the boat was like, oh, we going. We go, oh, I'm going to get this check. We are going. Because when your flesh is making the decision, you will go for the paycheck. When your flesh is making the decision, you'll go for whatever feels good to you. I'm telling you, what if the thing that you want so bad is not God's will, but you have convinced yourself it is God's will because you want it so bad? Oh, but can I tell you, just because you want it does not mean it's God's will. You might be headed to Creed because you made a decision that benefited your flesh wrong decisions and so they set sail and a storm ensues and I asked myself why didn't they listen to Paul why didn't and furthermore how did Paul know how did Paul know that a storm was coming was it prophetic because he's spiritual no that's coming later anybody would have known 
that this journey was going to be jacked up. It's in verse number 12. This is how Paul knew. It's in verse number 12. And since Fair Havens, that was the place in Crete where they were, was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, farther up the coast of, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a southwest and northwest exposure. Anything stand out in that verse right there? I had it capitalized for you. Winter. Why are you sailing in the winter? See, any person that knew anything about sailing knew you didn't sail in the winter. The winter was when the winds were crazy. You, you, all you had to do was look at the forecast. And Stevie Wonder could have told you, this ain't going to be a good trip. This wasn't even prophetic insight. So you got to be careful with I told you so. Because I told you so comes when you make the wrong decisions. But I told you so also comes when you move in the wrong season. Wrong season. It wasn't the season for sailing. Why are you in the boat, leaving for Crete, smiling, thinking it's going to be good, when this is not the season for sailing? We get in a I told you so situation when you are not aware of the season of life that you are in. How many know it is a nightmare to do the right thing in the wrong season? season. It's even a nightmare when you're doing the wrong thing in the wrong season. It wasn't the season to sail. Why did you leave from Crete when anybody could have told you you don't sail in the winter? The book of Ecclesiastes says something that I think we got to pay attention to. This is wisdom literature. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse number 8, there is a time for everything. Yeah, put it back up. I was quoting it. Yeah, leave it. It's a time. <laughs> For everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. God's not saying you can't get married, but he might be saying this isn't the God's not saying you can't start the business, but he might be saying this isn't the right season. God's not saying you can't start the ministry. I know you good, you can preach. I mean you should have the mic. This might not be the right. See, nobody wants to hear this in this entrepreneurial, I got to get mine culture. But get your, you got people, 18, man, I got, time's running out. I got to get this. No, this is, this is an issue in our culture today. You 16-year-old, a life coach? No, this is for real. These people ain't built nothing, ain't done anything, but got video posts. Of all the stuff that you've done, what? Well, this isn't a season. So another prayer before you go into 2023 is God help me be cognizant of the right season. Don't let me step into something before it's time. Can I tell you, if we would have planted this church anytime sooner than the time we would have planted this church, ooh, it would have been nightmare on Elm Street. But there was a season when God said, go. Are you paying attention to the season of life that you're in? They ignored Paul. They're setting sail. But just like Paul said, the storm came. They lost hope. It looked bad. They're in that place that some of you are in today, if you're honest. When you're on a boat and you started off on the journey and you thought it was God's will, but you left from a place of flesh and carnality. And now the winds are too much and the boat is breaking. And things are flying everywhere. You know what tripped me out on the boat? Is that on the grain boat, when the storm came, they had to start throwing the grain off the boat to survive. 
See, when you go out in your flesh, it's crazy how you lose the very thing that you set out to do because you went in the wrong season. Some of you, the very thing that you're trying to hustle and go get, you're going to lose because you're sailing out in the wrong season. What do you do when you're in the middle of a storm and it seems like all hope is lost and the wind and the waves are too much? They were about to lose it all. What do you do when you've made the wrong decision and you went out in the wrong season? What do you do? I'm so glad you asked. Who will come join me? I'll tell you what you do. You do verse number 22. That's what you do. When you've made the wrong decision and you've moved out in the wrong season and you don't know what to do, God told me to tell you you do. Verse number 22. Verse number 22 says... Paul stood up right after his I told you so speech. I told y'all this was going to happen. The wind and the waves are going crazy. Paul is talking. I told you this is going to happen. I told you back in verse 10 that we didn't have to go through all this. But in verse number 22, he flips it in the middle of his I told you so speech, which is a beautiful thing. Because here my thing, if you're going to tell me I told you so, you better offer some assistance too. If you're going to say, I told you so, don't just say, I told you so. You better help me. I told you not to speed. I know, but my car is broken down on the side of the road and I got a wreck. Are you going to help me get out of it? I love that Paul didn't just say, I told you so. He offered some assistance on the back end of the I told you so. It's in verse 22. He says, but take courage. Take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. Y'all missed the place. Shout right there. Paul said, take courage courage. None of you will lose your lives even though the ship is going to go down. I'm going to try that one more time because some of y'all still trying to wake up. Paul says take courage. None of you are going to lose your lives even though the ship is going to go down. Okay. No, it's all right. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the courtesy clap. I appreciate the courtesy clap. And I tell you why you gave me the courtesy clap. You gave me the courtesy clap because nobody wants that word right there. Nobody wants the word that the ship is going to fall apart. Because many of us, especially when we sailed out in our own strength and we sailed out in our own flesh, we don't want the ship. We don't want the business. We don't want the relationship. We don't want the thing to fall apart. But he said, guess what? I'm so sorry to tell you. I hate to be the bearer of the good news and the bad news. The bad news is you're going to lose this ship. The ship is going to break down. But the good news is you will not lose your life. You're going to lose some things, but you will not lose your life. And I want to tell somebody in here today, if you still got a pulse, you still got a purpose. Even if you lost some things, the things can get broken. The things can hit the rock. But how many are grateful that you're still here, that you're still standing? And if I'm still here, that means God's not through with me yet. Oh, the ship is going to go down, but I ain't going down. I might lose the job, but I'm not losing me. I might lose the business, but I'm not losing me. I might lose the money, but I'm not going to lose my life. Would you high five at least three people and say, take courage? No, take them. Tell them, tell them, take courage. No, tell them, take courage, take courage, take courage. Tell them, take courage. No, you need to tell them, take courage. Take courage. You lost some things, but you ain't going to lose you. Take courage. Take. Take. God didn't say, I'm going to give you courage. He said, you got to take courage. It's not going to be given. You sitting on the boat waiting for courage to come to you through Amazon Prime. God said, I'm not sending the courage. You got to take that courage back and say, God gave me a promise. I ain't going to die. I might lose this boat, but I'm not going to Take courage! Take it. Happy Thanksgiving. You've been focusing on the ship that you lost. Instead of realizing you got you. You're still here. Paul said, uh, take courage. We're going to lose the ship. Oh, I need to talk to the person that's falling in love with the ship. 
the relationship. And you keep scrolling, looking at their timeline. Seeing what they're doing. The ship is gone. And God ordained it. I'm not denying the pain. But he got a word. The ship won't make it, but you will. That's a hard word. That's a hard word. Because so many of us have fallen in love. The word from God was clear. The ship is not going to make it. But you will. I told him, don't get no expensive boat. Not only because it ain't in the budget. <laughs> but the text is clear. It's not going to make it. Paul got another word. Paul, how can I take this courage? Paul, where you get this courage from? And everybody else is panicking and you're poised. He said, an angel of the Lord came to me last night. He said, an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve. To whom I belong and to whom I serve. He said, I'm the important vessel. This is not the valuable vessel. This is the valuable vessel. I am his. I belong to him. Oh, can I give you a little praise hat? When you're in the middle of a storm, every once in a while when you're in the middle of a storm, you better look up to heaven and say, God, your property is in danger. I need your help. He said, I don't belong to me. I belong to God. And because I belong to him, I'm going to get to Rome. He gave me a promise. I'm going to get to Rome. Said, I got a promise. An angel came to me last night and said, don't be afraid. He said, I have to get to Rome. I told you so happens with the wrong decision. I told you so happens in the wrong season, doing the right thing in the wrong season. But when Paul confidently said, oh, we're going to be good because an angel came, He's showing us the power of God's sovereignty. Yes, that's it, that's it. Just a fancy way to say God is in control. I know it feels like the winds and the waves are in control, but I'm telling you, God is in absolute control. How is God in control when I'm about to file for bankruptcy? He is still in control. Because you're His. You belong to him. It's crazy because God's sovereignty is important to know at the end of the day he's in control. But how many know his sovereignty still does not stop your responsibility? It's crazy. Paul gets the word. He says, hey, don't worry, we're gonna lose the ship. But none of us are gonna die. It's 275 people on this boat. Paul said, I got a word. None of y'all are going to lose your lives. None of you are going to lose your lives. But then later in the text, when the storm got real bad, ooh, the sailors got ready to jump ship and go on a lifeboat. And Paul goes, hold up, hold up. If those sailors leave right now, they're going to die. Hold on, Paul. I thought you just said none of us are going to lose our lives. Now you're saying if the sailors jump ship, they're going to die? Paul, I'm confused. If I got a word that I'm going to make it to Rome, why can't I jump ship? Why can't I just go scuba diving? So is it God's sovereignty that I'm going to get there? Or do my decisions have consequences and I have a responsibility? Which one is it? Is it is it sovereignty or my response? It's both. God said, it is my sovereignty and it is your responsibility. He said, yeah, you're going to make it, but don't you jump off the ship now. Don't you leave. Stay faithful. Stay consistent. Stay where you are. If you jump off the ship, you're going to lose your life. You still have a responsibility, even though God has sovereignty. 
God told me I'm going to finish this sermon today, but I better not just nosedive off of this stage. I still have responsibility even when it's sovereignty. I got to stop. And look at what he does. Look at what he does. He does it on the boat. This is crazy, y'all. Worship team, come on. He's on the boat. He's about to hit the shore. They've lost cargo. He calls them all together. He said, thank you for not jumping ship. He says, uh, we're going to do something real spiritual. He said, everybody, you got to eat something. They had a meal in the middle of the storm. They did something as practical as eat. Paul got some Chick-fil-A sandwiches. He said, y'all hurry up. And he, and he gave thanks before he gave it. Because here's the problem. I don't know who this is for today. This isn't a sermon. This is a prophetic word for somebody in here today. You've allowed the storm on the outside to affect who you are on the inside. You're not eating. You've run to a bottle every single night. And you are not taking care of you. So Paul, in the middle of the storm, said, y'all better eat some food. Because we're going to make it. But you better have your strength. Because when this boat falls apart, you got to... You got to swim, and I don't need you drowning on the way. You better take care of you. Don't let that external storm mess you up on the inside. You better start eating right. Y'all don't like that practicality. You better start going to bed at night. You better exercise. You better take care of yourself because your story is not over. I need you to have the strength to get your Michael Phelps on and start swimming all the way to the shore because you're going to make it. You better take care of yourself. Don't let the storm on the outside affect you on the inside. Paul said, let's eat. And he gave thanks. He gave thanks in the middle of the storm. And they ate, made it to the shore. Why did they make it? Because God said, I told you so. I don't like an I told you so from you, but I told you so from God. When he says I told you so, you're going to make it. Oh, they hit an island and had troubles there. He didn't even get to Rome to three months later, but he got to Rome because God said I told you so. When you have a promise from God. Hold on to the promise. You can lose the ship. You can lose the friends. You can lose the money. He said, I told you so. You're going to make it. Everybody stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Father, today I pray for my brother. I pray for my sister. who's in the middle of the storm. Some are in storms that they caused. Some are in storms that just happen because life is life. But Lord, I thank you that even in the storm, we have a I told you so. We're going to get to Rome. We're going to get to our destination. Father, give us the strength and the grace to keep trusting. Just real soft. Um, Holy Spirit said, don't you, don't you finish that message without talking about your storm. When I tell you we couldn't have planted this church in any other season than when we did. It was so necessary because 2020 was a breaking year for me. 2020 was the year where depression and anxiety came knocking on my door. Up until 2020, I'm embarrassed to admit this, that I would have told you, man, if you're depressed, I mean, come on, you're still living, get over it. 
up until 2020, I would have told you, I mean, come on. At least you're still here. You're all right. But 2020 was a year for me. I didn't want to get out of the bed most days. Crying and not even know what I'm crying about every single day. Didn't want to preach. Question if God had still called me to preach. It was a storm. Felt like all hope was lost. Wasn't doing the practical, wasn't eating. Lost weight. But there was a moment in the storm that I'll never forget. It was the moment like Paul had on the boat where he made them in the storm give thanks. We were in our back room and the kids had a little praise and worship service on the TV. And my kids are watching their praise and worship service and I'll never forget it because the song that was playing was you make me brave. You make me brave. Your love crashing over me wave after wave. You make me brave. And I remember sitting there depressed watching my kids worship. God said, you get up and worship with them. He said, God, I can't. He said, God, I can't. And nothing in me feels like worship. He said, you get up and you worship with them. And so I got up and I'll never forget it. Standing in the room with Evie and Remy and Bubba, depression all around me. I'm telling you, for the first time in my life, the enemy even played in my mind with thoughts of suicide. I remember sitting up there with them singing, you make me brave. You make me brave. And I didn't feel it at first. When you keep singing something, sometimes you'll sing it to your spirit, believe stuff that your body doesn't even realize. And I felt the presence of God like I never felt before in my house, not in the church service, with my kids, singing off a little raggedy <laughs> Sunday school lesson. You make me brave. You make me brave. And here's the beauty of our Savior and what he does. Not only did I feel his presence, but I laughed for the first time. I laughed for the first time in weeks. You know why? Because here I am having a spiritual moment talking about you make me brave. You make me brave. And my youngest Remy is in the corner singing too. And I wasn't even listening because I was going through a storm to what she was actually singing. But I started listening to what she was singing. And I noticed that she was singing, she was rubbing her hair. I was like, well, she's expressive like that. Maybe that's... And all of a sudden, it took me a while to realize she wasn't singing, you make me brave. You make, she was singing, you make me braids. You make me braids. You, and it had me on the floor laughing that this girl was saying, I'm telling you, that was the laugh that my spirit needed. I don't know who's going through a storm right now, but God is big enough to make you brave. He'll make your braids if you need that too. But don't let that storm destroy you. You're going to lose the ship, but you won't lose you. Yeah. You won't lose you.